And today our preparation is going to focus on a PFM where the occlusal reduction is the first step. And for this we can utilize a series of different types of burrs, the 856-016 or the 847-KR-016, but basically start off with the C-plane and you want to use uh, the burr to your advantage and understanding that the thickness of this diamond is 1.6 millimeters at its widest area, the tip on the other hand measures 1.1 millimeter. I'm using the RGS-4 as a guide which is 1.5 millimeters wide and we can perform this check in the mouth as well. With the PFM we're looking at 2 millimeters of occlusal clearance when we're finished so a 1.5 millimeter depth plane not a depth cut necessarily but a depth plane like we're doing here is a very effective technique to get to the that 2 millimeters that we're looking for. And so we just continue uh, prepping and checking. You can see here that we're just a little bit under reduced, so we'll go back and reduce a little bit more and verify that reduction with the RGS-4. There are numerous ways we can check occlusal clearance. We can use putties, we can use different types of uh, matrices, uh, we can use wax, we can use bite registration or bite uh, preparation tabs. Uh, but I find it pretty easy just to go ahead and use this instrument that uh, has a known measurement. There we go, much closer to uh, 1.5 millimeters. And once we're done with that mesolingual cusp, we'll just go ahead and migrate on to the distolingual cusp and perform exactly the same function across this C-plane, this non-functional cusp reduction that we're doing. But we're not doing it all flat, we're doing it to mimic the triangular ridges. This diamond's getting a little bit uh, worn out, and I can usually resurface it and get a few more uh, minutes of use out of it, but it's just about had it. So there we go, we're looking at 1.5 millimeters with the RGS-4. Now I'd like to do the A-plane next, uh, not the B-plane, but the A-plane. And we're going to angle the diamond so that it parallels the C-plane. And we try to follow the morphology of the cusp a little bit so that uh, we have a rise and fall. That'll allow us to match the opposing a little bit better. But you can see how the A-plane and C-plane are nearly parallel to each other. After finishing the C-plane and A-plane, we can now turn our attention to the B-plane, which uh, is quite easy because uh, most of it's gone uh, at this point, uh, the upper portion anyway, by doing the A-plane. And uh, we just follow the rise and fall of the triangular ridges, including the distal cusp. So there you go, you can verify that you have 1.5 millimeters of clearance at this point. So let's use the RGS-4. We know that's 1.5 millimeters wide, so we can just slip it in here and we can see that indeed we do have, from incline to incline, at least 1.5 millimeters of clearance. And after we're done smoothing, we'll probably have closer to two. I like to make a, a few dots like this on the buckle cusps after I finish the A, B, and C planes, because if you've done them right, the buckle cusp tips line up with the uh, unprepared teeth, distal, and mesial. Looks pretty good. Just make sure that that A plane and C plane parallel to each other. Well, why don't we move on to the axial reduction? And for this step, I like to use the 878K012. It uh, 
can make a chamfer for, for you, but the chamfer is going to be quite narrow. And most of the time you want to have a chamfer that's probably closer to 0.5 to 0.7 millimeters in axial depth. This uh, very skinny tipped tapered diamond won't provide you with adequate chamfer depth. And remember a chamfer has a an angle that's at least 45 degrees downward towards the tissue. Uh, this provides that for you very nicely but it's just a little on the narrow side. It's kind of a good idea to set your finish line location at 0.5 millimeters above the tissue and then you can always uh, lower it if you need to. If you tend to go subgingival like so many of our students do uh, I would suggest you go a little higher up. If you've done this step correct, you're going to leave these little unprepared sections in approximately, and these you're going to remove uh, in the very next step. I like to keep these as narrow as possible buckle-ingually. Okay, so let's get started with interproximal clearance. And for this, I like to use a needle-shaped burr. This is an 859-010. It's very skinny. You could also use an 850-012. Some people even use 169L. So anything uh, of that nature can work quite well. There are really three keys uh, when trying to break interproximal contact. One is don't go too deep axially, don't over taper, and then don't hit the adjacent tooth. And it's, it's tough to do uh, the first two, but we can definitely protect the adjacent tooth by leaving a little sliver here. And that works out pretty well. Remember when we're doing this uh, interproximal clearance step. We are not interested in developing a perfect finish line. We're just interested in clearing the tooth from between the teeth and if the tooth structure. So if you can just focus on that, that that's really helpful. Um, sometimes uh, we, we get so worried about hitting the adjacent tooth, you tip the burr in towards the prep you're doing and you over prep or maybe you um, over taper. So it's important just to think about just breaking contact. And your margin is going to look terrible at this point. You're really not going to have a very pretty looking finish line. Um, I'm just lowering it down a little bit so that we have at a very minimum 0.5 millimeters of space between the preparation finish line and the adjacent tooth. This will allow us to scan that area with an optical scanner. Uh, it'll allow you to uh, place retraction cord very easily as well. And so I, I'm just doing the mesial here a little quicker uh, so you can see how we can break contact. And we don't have to hit the adjacent teeth. Now, it kind of looks like a mess right now. 